Hi, my name is Heather Petro, and I'm the Director of Annual Giving and Alumni Relations here at Riviera University. I'd like to welcome you to the first in a series of videos that we are hosted by the Riviera University Alumni Association called Alumni Connections. We created this series as a platform for a continued dialogue and connection between faculty and their former students. In today's video, I am honored to welcome Associate Professor of Business, Dr. Mark Meehan. Dr. Meehan teaches courses in business communication, organizational leadership, and global studies. In addition, he has consulted and taught in more than 70 countries around the world. When I asked Dr. Meehan which Revere graduate he would like to connect with, he had a lot of great suggestions, a testament to the professional relationships he maintains with his students long after graduation. We are thrilled though that he connected us with Tyler McGrady, a 2019 graduate who Dr. Meehan describes as sharp, engaging, and passionate. Tyler majored in business at RIV and is currently working as a project coordinator at Microgem, located in Hudson, as well as in Utah. It is now my pleasure to turn the discussion over to Dr. Meehan and, Dr. and Tyler McGrady. Tyler, my friend, it's great to see you today. Good to see you as well. How are you? I'm um, really well. Hey, you got a doctorate out of this thing. Did you hear that? I did hear that. I'll take it where I can, you know? You know honorary doctorate. Yeah. <clears throat> it usually comes when you build a building, though, so maybe you're just they're looking yeah. ahead. <laughs> I, just, I just ordered a sign for my desk. <laughs> hey, it's always great to see you and um, to catch up a little bit. So uh, for the purpose of our interview, Tyler, why don't you tell us a little bit about... Um, your time at RIV, and then those next steps from universe to your current role. Yeah. Um, so when I came to RIV, um, it was definitely one of my uh, top choices. Um, like a, a lot of people know and yourself, my grandmother had worked there for quite a bit. So I was always around the environment a ton. So it was always a top choice for me um, just because it felt like a sec. It felt like a home, really. I'd been around it almost my whole life. So um, when I went there, it was just a natural decision. And I was, uh, I was very pleased and happy on how it unfolded for sure. I mean, I wasn't, I was a commuter, wasn't an athlete. So that was new for me transferring over because coming from high school, I was, I was in the, in groups and I was in uh, sports and I did well in school, had a good relationship with my teachers. And then, um, the trans transferring process was, was interesting for me because it was out of my realm. You know, it wasn't, um, wasn't in any sports, wasn't on campus full time, wasn't super close with anyone. So it changed my perspective from <clears throat> having fun to this is serious now. And I am going to strive for an education and strive for a job after this. Um, so that was super important for me to notice was coming from high school where it was more fun and game to, <laughs> to college where it was time to buckle down. Yeah. Um, and I began having fun with it in terms of learning. You know, I did well and all my all my priority was was school at the time. So I was able to gear all of my focus towards that. And based off of that, I just started running through classes. And about the end of freshman year, um, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And I thought it was just going to come to me. So I thought the more classes I take, the, the, the faster I'm going to just know it's just going to click for me. Yeah. And I started taking, you know, summer courses and loading as much as on my schedule as possible because waiting for something to click and it just wasn't clicking. Um, so by the end of junior year, it was over. You know, I the, the bachelor's was over. There was nothing else to do. Um, and that scared me. But I will say one of the best parts of RIV was was you and Amir Tuzi um, being there to, to kind of assure me, don't worry, you're going to find something. And uh I remember many conversations with you in which I was just getting frustrated because I had maybe 100, 200 applicants out there, um, just applications out there trying to get a job. And they were all turned down left and right. And I kept telling you, just put me in front of someone. That's all it's going to take is just put me in front of someone, please. Like that's, that's the biggest difference is that these, these codings don't account for as an in-person. And uh, yeah. that's all I kept saying was put me in front of someone. Yeah. And uh, as soon as Amir did, um, Amir connected me with uh, Unifirst. And as soon as that happened, I just, it skyrocketed from there. I uh, started a career, went into sales for six months. And then from sales, I got a promotion into a supervisor role in the service department. Um, 
and it just grew from there. I just kept excelling. And then you then linked me with Tom and you put me in front of Tom and I was able to, you know, uh, demonstrate exactly what I was capable of doing. A lot of what I was incapable of doing, <laughs> but still had the intentions of accomplishing. Um, and he was more interested and fascinated in my drive to accomplish things that I hadn't and my interest in growing yeah. versus what my resume or what my capabilities showed. Um, so that was awesome. So, you know, Amir was huge in that. You and Amir were both huge in that area in which I was kind of questioning how, how, what is this going to take? How much more is this going to take in terms of school or, you know, maybe it's me, maybe something's not clicking for me. Um, but along the way, found it, you know, again, I'm still in the, position. I don't know what I want to do. I have no idea, but you know what? I'm carving out what I'm finding I'm good at and I'm running with it and what I'm not good at and uh, still trying to run with it. So again, I'm a sponge and that's as much as I can be right now. And Tyler, that's, I mean, that's something about you, right? <clears throat> that as you noted, it's hard to show that on a resume. You're super smart. You can learn almost anything. If you don't know it, you have the passion and the tenacity to figure out how you can know it. Um, not an athlete at RIV, <clears throat> but a jujitsu student, or I'm not sure what the term would be. Yeah, I wrestled for, for four years, and then I also competed in jujitsu. Right, right. And that was all in you. And so um, one of the things that reminds me of when we're talking is just this kind of I think sometimes silly reliance on things like um, LinkedIn with the idea that, you know, you get on LinkedIn, you get in Indeed, and, and that's all you have to do. And it's true. Occasionally it works and someone finds a job somewhere, but it's so much about getting to know you and, and us knowing you, we were able to make those bridges eagerly. I mean, I was, I didn't hesitate for a second once I knew you might be interested in that role of, um, jumpstart that um, to recommend you because I, I know who you are. And I think that's one of the cool things about Riff, you know, is that we really do get to know you and, and in knowing you, we can go to bat for you and those kind of things. So, so it's a fascinating place you found yourself now. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? And well, how about the company itself and the product and then towards, you know, your actual role in it and what that looks like? <laughs> Yeah, I'll sum it up uh, as best as I can, like I did with uh, Heather, because it's, it's complex. There's a lot going on. Yeah. So um, as you know, Tom uh, Moran, the owner of Jumpstart Manufacturing out of Nashua, was um, bought out by Microgym to start this manufacturing and production line. Again, because Tom is brilliant and his team is brilliant. Um, they saw something in that company that they felt could grow globally on an enormous scale. Yeah. which is awesome to know you work for someone like that is, is you have the trust of a large corporation trusting a very, in the grand scheme of things, a very small company to yeah. grow something that can change the world. And that's exactly who Tom and Jumpstart were. Um, so when they, when they inquired them or acquired them rather um, to start a production and manufacturing line for a spit cup and a saliva stick. So that's the best way to put it. Spit cup, saliva stick, instrument and cartridge. Um, and we are manufacturing and producing them out of Utah and out of New Hampshire. It is for a rapid testing for viruses. And it's not just COVID-19. It's for prior viruses and future viruses. So that's what's super unique about it is when I tell people, oh, hey, we're, you know, coming up with a rapid test. They say, don't that doesn't that already exist? But yeah, but, you know take into account the biological testing that goes on, you tweak it a little bit and we can test for anything else. Wow. So it's super unique in that, um, in that area that I'm working on something that's groundbreaking for not just me, for not just my remote people, it's, it's everybody globally. Yeah. Um, and having access to it is so important. So that's one, one of the things we're working on right now is called the ramp up, ramp up plan. So we went from, you know, a normal, what we thought we could produce and manufacture to, we need to ramp this up and not just double, not just triple, not just quadruple, just as high as we can go with it because everyone needs access to these as soon as possible. 
Um, so it's super unique to work on and I'm having a great time. And as a project manager, you asked what I was doing <sighs> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so Tom um, gave me essentially on my first day, it was a, a word document that had 15 different areas. He called them that I, he wanted me to monitor which in reality, like treed down and broke down into like 30 different areas. And, you know, so many people do to account for acronyms that I had never seen and had to learn on the fly. Again, I, like I, like I told Tom in the beginning, not a manufacturing engineer. I'm, I have no manufacturing or engineering background at all. Um, but I can try to handle it. And, uh, and he was like, Hey man, as long as you, uh, you have the effort to try. And I sure enough did. Um, you know, I just took it and ran with it as, as much as I could. So tell us about that first month. What, what, what was your life like that first month, my friend? Just yeah, we are month. coming to a close on that first month. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that first month was wild. It was a lot of just gathering information. So the first eight hours was how much information can I gather in terms of contacts, emails, phone numbers, uh, job titles, job duties. Um, location who's at what location who's designated to both locations um so that first eight hours was just so much information to wrap my head around and then the next week after that was contacting everyone and and i have more excel spreadsheets than i ever would have wanted in my life but <laughs> it's separating everything that's going on in my head and then by the end of that week piecing it all together um so it would make sense so then the the rest of that, you know, next three weeks, four weeks that we came in on, you know, I traveled to Utah. I saw the, the manufacturing production line out there um, in Hudson. I see what we're currently building. I just have a whole what you would call as a radar. Yeah. So now so now I have this radar <clears throat> perfectly fit out for me to look at, for me to see, for me to keep track of. Um, and that's something that Tom brought me in for, because when you're at Tom's level, you're handling so much and so many people that a lot of things can slip through the cracks. Yeah. Small things, you know, such as something not being delivered, but expected to be delivered. And then nobody took account for it not being delivered. Um, so something as small as that to something very large. Um, I need to be that radar for upper management to make sure that they understand where we're good. <laughs> well, I, I'm a contact and someone's phone right now is red green because in project management, there's there's this very stereotypical red green that you mark things at uh either things are red or either things are green um success or failure you know good or bad and uh i, I don't necessarily see it that way i think there's like you have taught me in the past nothing's ever this or this it's everything <laughs> in between yeah so I, in my opinion it's always everything in between and uh Hello, I work with a, yeah right i work with a work with a great group of people that um uh, understand my methodology and uh so far it's it's been helpful and uh, you know good feedback so i know you guys are building a plant in um hudson and that's gonna be a pretty big operation right how many people are going to be involved and what does that look like <laughs> currently sitting behind you is my excel spreadsheet for the production ramp up plan so i'm currently running a parametric spreadsheet in which is going to calculate the forecast for how many people we think we need to bring on to match the numbers that we're going to be producing, which is rough because it's theoretical, you know, and you're dealing with a lot of theory. And that's, that's a fun part of um, a startup is that a lot of it is theoretical. There's, there's very slim amount of things that are statistical and fact-based because you're working from the ground up. You're working with thoughts and hopes and prayers and, you know, just a lot of maybes and what ifs. And uh, so that's what I'm throwing together literally behind your screen right now is, is that. So um, we're looking in Hudson. I don't have the Hudson one up, but for example, in Utah, we're at pretty much, we're a little bit more ahead of Hudson in terms, that's where we're producing the uh, cartridge. So the, the, the spit cup. And um, I mean, right now we're at 120 people and we want to get upwards to probably double to triple that in the next oncoming two months. Wow. Wow. Yeah. In two months. But and there's so many spaces to fill. Everything is so important. I mean, you have line leads. Line leads are so important right now. And we're finding out that our line leads can't just be 
um, people who, you know, are excited to learn, like they actually have to have a background and see what they're, you know, doing um, in terms of assembly, because the assembly line is, is very in-depth and complex. Um, and then usually when you bring in a line lead, they bring in a whole entourage behind them. Huh. Um, yeah, which is, that's been unique to find out as well. So, you know, it's finding the right line leads that fit the culture that we want to create. Um, because building something from the ground up, you get to create the culture. You know, you get to nip the bad habits before they start. Uh, you get to carve out exactly what you want to see. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's line leads, there's engineers, there's quality engineers, manufacturing engineers, production engineer, uh, production managers. There's, there's uh, the whole nine yards, the whole kit and caboodle we have to take into consideration. It's not just a, a big hiring frenzy. There's a, there's a lot of thought that has to go behind hiring. And uh, you then have to think about strategically, how are you going to manage the time to hire all these people? You know, there's only so many HR people you can allocate, you know, and uh, it's so unique in terms of an HR person can look for the, for the typicals in an employee, mm -hmm. but on a, on a ground level, you know, you want your manufacturing engineers um, interviewing as well. You know, you want your quality engineers interviewing as well, because you need them to mesh out what they want to see on the line. So that's super important to, uh, to have found out. Fascinating, fascinating, Tyler. And how are you seeing your, your own self reflected in the people that you're hiring and the culture that's developing? How much of you is adapting to the culture and how much of you is helping to shape the culture? Most of it is shaping, you know? I, I Well, yeah, most of it is shaping because everyone's in a super shaping process right now. It's just a big ball of goo that it's up for us to mold. You know, <laughs> it's just, it's, uh, we're wet wax right now and we're trying to mold that wet wax. And uh, that's been a fun part of it. In terms of me being a part of the interview process, um, I'm more focused on, are you going to fit the culture of, are you willing to start with nothing and build something out of nothing? Mm -hmm. You know, are you willing to have, let's say you worked on a spreadsheet for the past 10 days, or you're working on work instructions for the past 10 days. And then for me to come in and say, nope, clean it off. We're starting from the beginning. I need you to be able to adapt and change with that and be okay with it. You know, you can stay strict to, to wanting to get the job done in the way it needs to be done. But you need to be flexible in terms of, this is a startup. We're starting from the ground up. I may ask you to start from the ground up 12 different times, but if that's what it takes, then that's the foundation we build on. You know, we're walking in wet cement right now. Yeah. Tyler, just knowing you, I mean, I can just see you flourishing in that environment, but many people would just be, right? I mean, you really have to have a certain ability to adapt and the mindset towards change that allows that, allows you to flourish. Um, how does that appear in other parts of your life besides work? Have you always known that about yourself or is that something that you're really seeing come to the forefront because you're in this crazy context of growth and change? I don't know. I lived, a, I, I lived an interesting life in terms of change going on. So I was always usually able to adapt to change pretty well. Um, but it really came to rise when I accepted this, um, this yeah. position is that I thrive in chaos. You know, I want to, I want, you know, fire to be going off behind me and have to figure out how to put it out along the way. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it, there's just, I need to have a million things on my plate in order to excel. And I understand that not everyone is like that, but mm -hmm. I found that out about myself probably along the way, you know, first as well, mm -hmm. is that it excites me. It, just, right. it, it gets me up in the morning. It wakes me up in the morning is knowing that I have so many things to do. So I just got to go do them. You know, if I have a, and that's in prior positions, that's where I felt stagnant is when I only had a couple things to do and I became humbly the best at them or um, just did them quickly and they weren't very difficult or challenging. Um, I was just able to conquer them very quickly. So if I don't have something that's one challenging, and two, overwhelming in quantity and quality, then it's just not gonna be enough for me. And I'll get stagnant and that's, that's my danger zone because I don't wanna get stagnant. <laughs> Sounds like you have a couple of years at least maybe to, yeah. you don't have to worry about that too much. <laughs> Absolutely, for sure. No, this is, this is a great experience because this is what it, 
I'm feeling what it feels like to wake up in the morning excited. Um, I, I can't get to work early enough. You know, there's not enough hours in my day versus watching the clock. There's, there's not enough hours in my day, yeah. um, which is great. Yeah. Tasia doesn't love it. Tasia doesn't love that at all. But uh, I'm working around the clock. Now, you and Tasia have been, been together for quite a while, I mean, since high school. And just so after you, high school. Oh, just after high school. So you guys are navigating a lot. I mean, how does yeah. all that work? What does that look like? We have two different paths, you know, but along the same mission. So we, you know, we have the same goals, but we're, we're on two different paths in terms of, uh, you know, she's still in school for nursing and that's what she wants to do, which is great. Couldn't support it more. Um, she's going to be an outstanding nurse. Whereas, and I took the business path and on the end of the business path, there's a million different options. So, you know, when I was, you know, talking to her about getting a job, I'm like, there's just so much to do. Whereas in nursing, it's, you're going to be a nurse. You know, I mean, there's different facets of nursing, but relatively you're going to be a nurse. Yep. Um, and then the education after that, you know, doctor, you know, a bunch of other routes to go down. Um, but in business, it's just so wide, far and wide. Yeah. And uh, within that, you know, you got your traveling. The traveling has been new to us. So we're getting over that. But it's been a great experience for both of us to go through, for sure. It's it's seeing each other grow on a level that mm. I, I never would have anticipated, but it's just such a stage in our life watching each other grow. Now, I love that. I love that. It's, um, it's so important to be able to approach it that way. You're not, you're not changing just to change, but you're, you're growing and you're moving forward and you're doing that together in this incredible moment in your lives that is just so full of it. It's just a, it's a wonderful moment. So it is, it's overwhelming at times. It's, you got to remind yourself to, to take a second. Yes. And, uh, see where you're at and see where you're, see where yourself is at and then see where you're both at. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you got to recalibrate, but um, oftentimes you can be on the same wavelength and not even think about it. You know, you can be doing completely opposites and feel like you're doing opposite things, but you're still in the same, same wavelength. And uh, I mean, we're at that stage where it's, you know, I'm not just going to work she's coming with me, whether she's physically or not here. And I know it's the same thing for her. It's, you know, we're at the stage in our life where it's doing things for each other because we know there's, there's end goals that we both want to meet. Yeah. Beautiful, Tyler. <clears throat> what a balanced approach, you know, is this a healthy balanced approach? And we know balance doesn't last, right? Balance is, I was about to say, hey, you know, balance is a whole <laughs> other topic. Yeah. Got to stay on it. So, um, you know, since, since we're talking from a rib perspective, um, and, and, you know, we at RIV would love to claim so much responsibility for this amazing young man's success. But Tyler, I know, I know you came to RIV with an amazing brain, the ability to, to think and cut through things. I remember business communication as you sat quietly on the right side of the room. And one of the first conversations we had after I graded some of your papers and thought, whoa, who is this guy? What is this guy about? Um, what did RIV do to prepare you? How, how did RIV help? And I'm also curious about what RIV didn't do, what RIV could have done better um, or more of. Yeah. Um, okay. So we'll start with, I would say the RIV helped me in ways that are different than a lot of other students, but I can see where this is going to connect with a lot of alum is going to be in terms of coming in relatively separated from the college itself. Um, so like I said, with that difficulty transitioning, yeah. um, I didn't, again, I didn't have a ton of friends there. I had pretty much one and I stuck by him the whole time. Um, but yeah, I didn't have a ton of friends, wasn't super close with professors other than you and, and Amir. <clears throat> um, it wasn't playing sports, wasn't involved in other things. And that's not Riv's fault. That, that was my seclusion. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, I had to learn how to handle that and become independent and change gears from when it's time to hunker down and get the work done. And uh, I will say that it helped me in that way. It helped me become far more independent, um, far more self-thinking, um, and far more self-reliant instead of relying on other people. Yeah. So I had to remain accountable 
for what was going to be moving forward. Yeah. And I think that Riv taught me that unintentionally. I know that I know that um, in strategic management, you taught a lot of live your life intentionally. And I know oftentimes I, I had an argument with you in class about <laughs> a lot of the way, a lot of our lives are paved from the unintentional happenings. And I want to say that Riv unintentionally taught me a lot of the values that I'm moving forward with. You know, unintentionally, they taught me to be self-reliant. And that was just, we're not going to provide you with all these friends and loving atmosphere. You know, you kind of have to figure it out yourself. Yeah. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. You know, I don't, I'm not a person that reacts well to coddling. So, you know, it was one of those things where I, I had to learn to pave my own road. And yeah. they, you know, they gave me the road. They gave me the rough sketch. And it was a matter of me kind of building it and paving it out myself. And the resources were there when I needed them. So that's what mattered to me. Yeah. Um, so that's where it helped me is, is staying focused and staying self-accountable, yeah. you know? So that was probably the biggest thing that Rip taught me. And I know that's not like, oh, they taught me, you know, accounting and, and business management and all that. But they, I think what's important is that Riv understands that they impact people unintentionally as well. Yeah. And um, I know that kind of drives off your live life intentionally, but um I think that they did it unintentionally is how I feel. And I'm, I'm grateful for that unintentional happening. Well, I think, you know, there's, there's implications of this process of education, right. That are beyond what we can anticipate. And that's the part of the beauty of a curriculum and, a, and an educational process, because the individual, the individual brings so much to the table. They bring their own agency, their own volition, their own ability to lean in or lean back. And um, and we all we all respond differently to those opportunities, right? And I think you leaned in, in a in a difficult context in some ways. You leaned in, and um, <clears throat> and you and you got everything you could out of it. And and I, and I love that what you said about coddling. I remember when you know we had a quest, we had lunch at the National Garden, and you had said, Mark, I've been I've applied to. 6,000 jobs. And I said, you have not, you haven't applied uh -huh. Then at these stupid indeed things, whatever that is, you know, and, uh, but you had to work that out and you had to think that through and, um, and that's all good, right? It's all part of the process uh, that, that is shaping of you, uh, which is awesome. Awesome. So and that's, I, to your question of where Riv didn't necessarily yeah, yeah. help is, yeah, um, you know, I think a lot of universities and colleges right now are so focused on Indeed and LinkedIn and creating those connections. And I agree with that on a lot of levels, but it's not, it's not matter of fact. It's not set in stone. It's not the, it's not paved. I mean, you're dealing with applications that don't really care about the person. They care about the numbers. Right. So, yeah, to your point of having our discussion where I submitted 6,000 applications online through these platforms, it was, I did do that because that's what I was told to do. That's, that's what I was taught to do, what I was educated to do. And, you know, you're, you're very pushed on making connections through LinkedIn. Um, ultimately, that doesn't, that still hasn't, and I can't tell for the immediate future, isn't going to happen or help in terms of those connections. But what does matter is in-person connections. We cannot lose sight of that. Um, I know that's something that you value and that's something that you told me and I told you a million times, just put me in front of someone. I think that's where Riv kind of um, lacked was being able to put physical bodies in front of other people. Um, a lot of it was, I get the electronic wave, I get the digital wave of things, but in-person is what matters. It really does. And, and, you know, Tyler, I love that. It, it's the harder part, right? It's so easy to, to be on LinkedIn and say, okay, I'm on LinkedIn. And it's like a little box you can check off. But um, it's a whole different thing to really work a yeah. room or to work a, a series of relationships. And, 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 you know, you're on your way now. You have established relationships in the business community already. And, and you have this wonderful path to success and growth that's going to just keep propelling you forward. I mean, you're not going to need, so. need a lot of that stuff. <laughs> and 
Hey, I'm but that, that's not a knock on Riv. I understand that they have to follow, you know, sure. they have to follow the trends and on online and, and digital is the trends for sure. But you can't remember what got you to the got you to the show. Right, right, right. Well said. Well said. My friend, I'm looking at time and I realize that um, they said 20 minutes and we did warn them we could do this for six hours, but uh, we've gone <laughs> over a bit. <laughs> so Tyler, I want to say thank you. Um, you know how much I love and respect you and uh, what an honor it is to be your friend and, and how exciting it is to see you and Tasia in this moment in your lives where you're just seeing all this growth and change and you're grabbing it and you're running with it and you're enjoying the ride. Um, it's a blast and congratulations on everything. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mark. And thank you guys for everything you've done for me. I do truly appreciate it. Wouldn't be here without you guys. Yeah.